All right. Um, we've, uh, ju we're just about to wrap up particle kinetics. Uh, if you remember, well, we've got a couple things going into it. Of course, the particle kinematics, and as you went through that last homework and any other problems, uh, a lot of times to finish these up, you've got to bring in some of the kinematics to get enough equations for all the unknowns. But the first of the kinetics that we worked with was the F equals MA, which generally works for general problems. If you need acceleration, or you need the forces and you have the acceleration, or you just have something rather straightforward about the uh, uh, kinematics that leads into the problem, or if the forces are constant, then that's generally a pretty good, uh, pretty good approach to these kinetics problems. We just finished up last week with the work energy equation, which, which works very well for any position-dependent part of the problem. Uh, even if it's just asking for how far did it go under certain conditions and the like. But if the force is position-dependent, uh, or there's a spring in the problem, then the work energy equation works particularly well, uh, especially uh, even though we're not doing it, if you notice, we're skipping chapter four, which is systems of particles. If you have systems of particles, the work energy equation still works very well because you just sum up whatever the particles are doing uh, individually and just sum it up in, the, in the, each of the parts uh, uh, wherever it happens to be, and it just works real well. It's almost like a, an accounting problem uh, when you have a lot of things going on a lot of position-dependent things going on, uh, and or a lot of particles in the problem. Uh, we'll get our last one here today, and then we will uh, sort of go back over everything with rigid body motion, where we're no longer looking at everything as a particle, but as an actual object. And so we'll pull in today uh, the impulse momentum method. Uh, which works very well, as we'll see, for time-dependent problems, especially when the force is dependent upon time, uh, which is uh, a fairly useful way to look at things like uh, rocket launches and the like. Um, depends on, on just what the setup is. Uh, or if time is either given or requested then uh, uh, it works particularly well. But as we'll see, uh, as we develop it, it starts from F equals MA anyway. It's not that uh, these are really different. These are just variations of a theme. These all come, everything comes from F equals MA anyway. Uh, it's especially obvious with this method, the impulse momentum method, that it's just a different way to write the uh, impulse momentum, uh, it's a different way to write MA that allows us to uh, take a different look at certain problems. So uh, the MA side could also be the time rate of change of MV itself. Uh, we typically take M as constant, that comes out, then the derivative is just dvdt, which is the acceleration. Um, but if we, if we do it this way, then uh, we can define the linear momentum as that quantity mv. Our book happens to use a capital G for momentum. Um, I, I think it's just clearly obvious why you use a G there. Um, so, uh, nothing more than what we called momentum before in physics one, and then this becomes the, the time rate of change of the momentum vector. Remember, momentum, momentum really is a vector. It's a full vector in, uh, in its uh, various uh, incarnations. 
students do sometimes forget, though, that it is really a, a <coughs> complete vector in its own way. Uh, of course, the, phys the, the special case, if those forces happen to sum to zero, either there are no forces or what forces there are uh, all sum to zero, then, uh, of course, that was a situation of no acceleration. But when we look at it now, then it means that the momentum vector is constant. There will be no change in momentum. So what um, forces tend to do then is change momentum and it allows us to see just how they do that when we look at the uh, uh, equations in this form. So uh, let's, uh, let's start from here then and develop it a little bit farther because we're not quite where we want to be yet with this. So we have this time rate of change of the momentum vector. If we do a little bit of simple algebra, bring the dt over, then we have the sum of the forces, dt equals dg. And of course, that in itself is trying out for integration because that's the differential form. Uh, only so much you can actually do with that. So we'll integrate the left hand side from t1 to t2. Oftentimes t1 is zero, but it doesn't need to be. And we'll integrate this side from g1 to g2. And we get then that the uh, change in the momentum vector will be the area under the force time graph. Which is the, the step there that makes it uh, this method, the impulse momentum method particularly useful for time-dependent problems. If we have force varying with time, then it's extremely useful to do it in this, in this way uh, to figure out what the changes in velocities are going to be as reflected in the change of momentums. So uh, it's this form here that is the impulse momentum form because uh, that left-hand side, the uh, integral of the force time function is the impulse, and then this other side is, well, not really the momentum, but the change in momentum, but that's where we get the, the uh, name for it as uh, impulse momentum method. <coughs> All right, pretty simple setup, just uh, comes right out of F equals MA directly, uh, and no great shakes here. I think the only thing that's new really is that our book happens to use G for momentum. I think in physics we used, what, a small p, if I remember, and uh, man, it's different in almost every book. So. We'll leave that side up over there as we set up a couple problems. All right, so imagine we're doing what we always do in this, these classes, is move crates across the floor. So this time we'll do it with a force that's a function of time. of 10 kilograms and the force as a function of time in newtons looks something like this. 100 so goes up to a maximum of 100 newtons. Here's the time scale 
seconds. And we have a time varying force applied to that that looks something like this. Uh, in 10 seconds, it goes from zero up to the 100. We'll make it easy to start with, make it linear. And then in the next five seconds, it comes down to 20. Comes down to 20 newtons, and then is level from there. So that's our, our first take on it. If this was a, a constant force uh, problem, then uh, of course the force would come out of the integral and we'd have just delta T, uh, F delta T equals delta G, uh, and no great, uh, great uh, revelation for that form there. Then. So let's find velocity. after 10 seconds, and then again after 15 seconds. Just to get warmed up, not, no, no, great, uh, no great difficulty in this one. Uh, if we want to find the velocity, we're going to have to find the um, change in momentum. Since it's a one-dimensional problem, we don't need to use vector on this then, and uh, it's nothing more, and since the mass is constant, it comes out of the derivative, we just have m delta v, and that's going to be equal to the area under the force time graph. Just to make sure it works, just to uh, see it's a lot easier than if we were doing some other problems in this way. Um, so V2 equals 1 over M. Well, M is uh, 10, so we'll put that in. And then the area under the graph, starting from rest, so V1 is 0. And the area under the graph is one half, let's see, for the first 10 seconds, of course it's that area, uh, one half the base, and the base is 10 seconds. Now these are, these are of course not geometric triangles we're taking the area of, these are uh, force time triangles, and then the height is 100 newtons. And that would be added on to V1, but in this case, it starts from rest, so V1 is zero. But we don't want to forget that. And so we get, what, 50? We have Newton seconds per kilogram. Uh, a Newton is a kilogram per meter second squared, so one of the kilograms goes out, one of the seconds goes out, and we're left with just what we should be, which is meters per second. And so that Newton seconds, this area bit here, is the impulse. The impulse added to the object that causes it to have a, a momentum change. And the momentum change is the other parts of it there, the delta V and the M. All right, for the other part, You can do it two ways. You can do it again from start and figure out the entire area to figure out the velocity after 15 seconds. 
or we can just figure out how much additional area there is, and that's going to be a lot easier. So we'll call that V3. So V3 is going to be V2 plus whatever else is added on. And that's the delta V, and then add on the extra area, which comes in two parts. The triangular upper part, one half the base times the height. Base is five seconds on this upper triangle. The height is 80. That's the upper triangle here. But don't forget, then we also need to add on this lower triangle that's uh, five seconds wide by 20 newtons high. And V2 we've got is the 50 seconds there. Uh, sorry, 50 meters per second. Very simple. Nothing you couldn't have done in uh, in physics one. And I think that last bit yeah, comes out to be 50. This all comes out to be 30. So we get a final velocity of 80 meters per second. Adding on this last little bit of area. There. So that whole area then, of course, is the change in momentum. And you can do it between any two times that uh, are of interest. Your, Alan? Your, so your change in, uh, in P is just the magnitudes you're not doing? Change in P? I don't know what change in P means. Oh, change in the force? Yeah. Yeah. You're just using the magnitudes you're not doing, because the 80 was a, was, was a downward change. Whereas the 100, well, the 100 was upward. The, the force decreased, but it was still in the same direction. This is still a positive force. It's just a weaker positive force now. But that kind of leads into the next part of the problem that we can look at. So let's, uh, that, was, that was just warm up. A little bit of chance to get used to the units. Just to check to see, make sure the units worked out and the idea was working. But let's upgrade it a little bit. Let's upgrade it a little bit. Find, uh, find the same two things, only now we're going to add to it that the static coefficient of friction is 0.4 and the kinetic is 0.3. We had no friction in the earlier problem and now we do. I think, uh, I think it'll serve to, uh, to start another diagram and see what's going on. So we have this same diagram. Better. And then remember it comes down to 20. And 
and then stays level from there. What's the difference now that we've got friction in the problem? Well, remember, um, when we start pushing on an object for a little while, it doesn't go anywhere because static friction is big enough to oppose that <coughs> force. Until some point when the force is actually big enough to overcome the static friction and then the box starts to move. <coughs> what does that look like on our graph? This force here is the time dependent P and we should make this a little bit more general and just call it force because now we have two forces in the problem. What does the friction force look like? It's negative. For a little while, it's only in opposition to the applied force. So for a little while, we'll have a negative line going down at the same slope. And that will be the friction force. Negative because it's in the opposite direction of what we've already been using as the positive. But at some time, the friction force is big enough that the box actually starts moving. Then what happens to the friction force? Goes up a little. By up a little, you mean like that, I hope. Remember, the kinetic friction is a little bit less than the static friction. Once you get it moving, it doesn't take as much force to keep it moving as it took to actually get it moving. But then the static friction is essentially constant no matter what the velocity and would continue on like that at, uh, at what's supposed to be level. But still, it's true that the area under the graph is the change in momentum. It's just for a while, for this first section here, what's the area? Zero, because the area above and below are the same. So after some particular time at some particular force, then we start getting at least some net positive area because the area above is greater than the area below. So we can redo this, uh, the question we had here. Um, so the area underneath, well what we need to do first is figure out what these forces are and what that time is so that we can then uh, take the area from then on. So you remember how to find these peak uh, forces there? The maximum static friction. <coughs> remember how to find that? I know that's not your car, Helen. Your horn doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Remember how to find this maximum static friction? find the maximum static friction, this biggest amount when finally the box will break free from the surface. U times the 
static coefficient of friction. In fact, this is how we come up with the static coefficient, coefficient of friction. We actually run this test, see what the maximum force is, but then it's mu s times no times what? The normal which sometimes is equal to the weight, sometimes it is not. Be real careful with that. It's extremely easy to come up with a problem where the normal force does not equal the weight. In this case, you're that lucky, but not always. All right, so we can figure out what that is then. 0 point, not 3, it's 0.4 times the mass times g and so we can figure out what that maximum force is and we can figure out what time it occurs so uh, that's 39.2 39.2 newtons, and if we look at the graph, we notice our applied force goes up a newton every tenth of a second. So what makes it pretty easy to figure out what the time is at 3.92 seconds. So we know at 3.92 seconds, we finally get enough force where we start having positive area greater than the negative area below that and we can start then figuring out the, uh, the rest of the details from there. So it's not until 3.92 seconds that it actually starts moving. So our change in momentum will then be the area, uh, the total area with positive area above and negative area below, area under Ft, and that will be beyond um, 3.92 seconds. And so we can figure out what that is. So we're looking for V2 after 10 seconds. That's 1 over the mass. Once we divide through by M, solve for V2. Uh, v, V1, remember, is 0, so it's not a big deal. And we take the area of the graph. However, you'd like to calculate it. Um, break this into some kind of some kind of different areas, I guess. So we have an area there, an area there, an area there, up to ten seconds. Remember that area below the axis is negative area because that's an opposing force, that's a negative impulse and actually takes momentum away from the system. So how are we going to add those up? Let's see, one half. The base is 10 minus 3.92, which is what, 6.08, all right? And the height is 100 minus 39.2, which is 60.8. Is that right? Yeah, Alan, is that okay? Chris, you're happy? 
Are you ever happy? Joe? How do you get to you again? Uh, I know that finally it breaks through when F equals, or when P equals 39.2, because that's the maximum static friction. And notice that the force increases uh, one newton for every tenth of a second. So I'm going to get that many newtons in that many seconds. It's that or you figure out with a slope of uh, 10 newtons per second where that T is. So that is area one. And then area two has the same base. It goes up to the 39.2. Same units, Newton seconds. That's negative area, it's underneath, so we subtract it. It's got the same, um, same base, and its height is 29.4, which comes from where? The kinetic friction. Control. Kinetic friction. Which is mu k times n, which is 29.4. Remember that the static friction, maximum static friction, is a little higher than the kinetic friction usually. Again, units of Newton seconds. And that's the area at three. Close brackets. Now, if you'd rather, you can figure out what the uh, what the sum of the forces is and, and graph that. Um, you could take take this graph and and recast it. Um, so this would be the sum of the forces with time and actually add these together so that the, we don't actually have a, a net force until this uh, 3.92 seconds. And then we go up uh, still at that same rate. Um, For however long. And then uh, I'll notice that the friction force is actually greater than the applied force out in the constant section. So you'd actually drop below the line from the net force diagram. But that should give you the same area we had here to start with. I think it's easier if you just calculate the area straight away. But you might not. Chris likes things more difficult, I know. All right, so if we do that, then I believe we get 24.4 uh, meters per second. What was it? The first time after 10 seconds, 50 meters per second. Now with friction taken into account, we only get 24.4. But with the time varying force, just simply taking the area under the force diagram uh, to calculate the impulse is a much easier way um, than if we did it using F equals MA. All right, take a minute or two and 
figure out V3 after 15 seconds. starting over again, or just figuring out how much additional area there is, which is probably the easier way to do it. So that would be four, and you can take this whole thing as five if you want. However you choose to divide it up. Yeah. Is it just going to be zero because the kinetic friction force is higher than the applied force? It might be. Just because the applied force is less than the friction force doesn't mean when it gets to that point it's not moving still. So it's some kind of momentum. You have to figure that out. Calculate a couple other areas. You can split this one into two if you want. Remember that uh, part of it's negative, part of it's positive, so they're probably not good to put them together. It's not like it's a big deal. Just remember those are negative. for is the additional area, the additional net area. We've got a couple good chunks of positive and a fairly small chunk of negative. So it's the net area that gives us the net change in velocity. Don't forget that uh, you have to divide through by the mass. Because that gives us that those areas give us the change in momentum, not the change in velocity directly. Philly got it? Nope. Yeah, be careful. If you're only calculating the additional area, you've only calculated the additional velocity. Don't forget to divide through by mass. seconds. Now the applied force is dropping. The uh, kinetic friction force is still the same. So we have these additional areas.
that's what, 200 newton seconds additional impulse, additional change, positive change in momentum. Area 5 is 5 seconds by 20, 100. area by what about 53 divide that by the 10 kilograms so that's an, an additional uh, 5.3 no something am I are my numbers right there yeah, 153 a oh, 153 yeah by 10 so an additional 15.3 so we get to 39.7 So that additional area, that is delta G, because that's the impulse. Units of newton seconds. Divide by the 10 kilograms and add it all. All right, one remaining question then. find out the time when this comes to a stop because now the applied force is less than the friction force so it's going to come to a stop sometime so find T when V equals zero and what we're looking for here now is when the rest of the area, which will be greater underneath than above, because it's a greater force below than above. Remember, it's only 20 up here. So when that area is enough to take away the, uh, the total momentum we have by that point, which is, uh, well, you figure it out. <coughs> so, what we're looking for is when do we get to a certain time that the total area above is equal to the total area below, and it'll come back to a stop then, because the total impulse then is negative. I'm sorry, is zero. So we're out here to 15 seconds. That's 10. You need to figure out how much farther do we need to go to get a total area above equal to the total area below, or a net area below enough to take off the last of the momentum that we had at that point. Let's see. Well, I'm going to give this to you. E3 is what? 39.7. Sorry, I need it. Okay, so we have a 
leftover momentum of 397, because it's that 39.7 meters per second times the 10 kilograms. So once this leftover area, which is greater below than it is above, remember there's our x axis. Once that area above uh, plus the area below equals <coughs> minus 39.7 newton seconds, <coughs> then we know it will come to a stop. Samantha, okay? You're frowning. No units. Could be weeks. Come ask me, ask Chris. How come you guys don't talk to each other? What happened between you two? They're always laughing. But I can see the tears. What? So how much time to get rid of uh, 397 newton seconds? You can do the total area if you want, but we've already got all that. We only need to do the additional area left over with a, a certain amount of momentum. And we need enough impulse to Finish that momentum. Bill, okay? Got something? <clears throat> Check with Chris. Chris is right, I think. Once the total area above equals the total area below, then the total change in momentum is zero. And since it started at rest, it will then finish at rest at that time. there 
and then the rope goes around and comes to a, a motor. Something like that. Okay, pretty simple picture. All right, some of the details. Five hundred kilogram log. Coefficient of friction at the base. Static fifty percent. Static forty. Startup will do something like this. Let's make that a T for tension. All right, so in startup. The motor is going to do something like this. Uh, after three seconds, it'll reach its full force of 1800 newtons. But before then, it's got a little bit of a curve ramping up to that. Something like that. And then once it gets there, it'll run at constant force. So it takes a little bit for it to actually be applying the, the full force it needs to. And the tension in the line as a function of time is the 1800 maximum but it takes t over 3 squared seconds to get there. So when t equals 0, there's no tension. When t equals 3, it's at full tension. OK, that's the pieces there. All right, so find then the velocity after 5 seconds. different than the one we just had. For a little while, there's not enough force in the line to actually get it moving. But after a short period of time, there is. And so you need to figure out where those times are and what the force is at that time. Don't forget to take the pulley into account. Let me draw a free body diagram from the log. back for a little while it's just the static friction we're trying to overcome and then 
later it's the kinetic friction when it actually gets moving and then you can figure out the, uh, the static force thereafter. draw the friction force on here like we just did. In fact, I wouldn't mind at all if you did that. I'd like to see what you put. And then remember, once we get up to a certain force, it'll then start moving. And only from then on are we actually adding impulse, net impulse, to the log text, we give it some net change in momentum. friction is overcome. From then on we're adding net impulse and thus net momentum to the system. And adding momentum to the system means it's speeding up. Since it's constant mass. to that force because of the pulley over here it only needs to come up to half of that and it'll start moving <coughs> because this if you remember is not T but 2T so as soon as the motor is up to 12.25, then the uh, system will start up. So that's nice. So somewhere in here. <coughs> somewhere in there. Uh, it takes almost three seconds to get it to move. Sound about right. We overcome static friction. You can figure out what time that is just by solving for the time t. About 2.48 seconds.
About 2.48 seconds, it'll finally break free. Is that what everybody got? After that, now we have enough net impulse that we're adding, it'll start to move. Same thing as if the net force is now positive. But since the force isn't positive, the acceleration isn't constant. Sorry, since the force isn't constant, the acceleration <coughs> isn't constant. So from then on, now you don't forget that the um, that's the force just to get it moving, but the force will actually, the force required to overcome kinetic friction will actually drop a little bit. It's uh, actually 1960. And the force required by the engine then is half of that. 980. So a little bit above half half the startup. So we're really only looking at this area here as the net impulse. Is that right, Travis? Does that sound about right? We're going to want to list it. Boycott it. Okay. So you can do the integral from then, uh, from that 2.48 seconds up to the 3. You can integrate uh, that. And then after that, it's, it's a constant force, constant acceleration system after that. But no sense going to the constant <coughs> acceleration equations. Just add up the area uh, out to five seconds. That's all. That's all. Sound? No. Uh, nope, that's not what I got. Check it, Travis. Because it, it did take me a, a couple of times too, to get a little bit mixed up with some of the numbers. You have something? Yeah. yeah that's closer than Travis's. Still not what I am. Delta G equals M delta V, and that's what's the area under the under the curve. So uh, for a little over half a second from 2.48 seconds up to 3, we have the uh, force applied by the winch, which is actually the 1800. But you have to subtract from that the not the uh, kinetic friction, but half of that because of the two t. So minus 1960 newtons over two, and that's the, that's just the. Uh, Additional impulse during startup 
but then there's another two seconds after that where now it's running at full power. Some of that's just coming over friction. Um, some of that is uh, actually adding speed to it. But I think that should be should be the pieces we need. You can arrange that to look at it. You can do the uh, total positive uh, impulse minus the total negative impulse. No, Chris? Is that okay up there? qualification and end up trying something like that. Luckily, you can take them again. Okay, is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Anybody have a value yet? Let me see if I have this broken out into pieces. Eh, not quite. Don't forget, you divide through by the mass. This is the impulse added. The impulse per unit mass is actually the change in velocity. Seventy-four meters per second now. Okay, but it's uh, there's a bunch of minus signs that get in here. You've got some uh, integrating to do there. Don't forget the squared is over the three uh, as well on the bottom. Should come up with. I came up with seven point six five as the velocity after five seconds. Seven. Okay. I, I did I round it grossly. No. Yeah, grossly. I did check this, so I'm yeah. not always confident in my numbers. But well, of course you got it. I just put it up on the board. Makes it easy, doesn't it? Did you remember that this is the, the fourth and log is twice the force being applied by the engine because of the <coughs> pulley here? Think so. It's only ten percent error. Yeah, gonna push the motor to the max. Yeah, after a little while, it starts smoking. Probably at details on the calculations. 
probably just a little minus sign or a squared or something. The physics is there. The physics is in place. We have uh, net force being applied here during the startup phase, and then net force being applied after it's running for a bit, and now at constant, constant force. Um, do this for me if you haven't already. Draw the the uh, friction curve in response. So that's still a, a T time force time graph. So and remember, we know that at uh, a little bit before this point, it actually breaks free. Draw the friction response. Is that what you were doing there? Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah, if you overlay it, you just set your area with levels left over. Where? Where's the... This is the friction. No. Is it 12? No. 26? No. Until 2.5 seconds? No. No? No. I mean, look, look at your graph. Look at two seconds. Say, you just go to two seconds and say, what would be happening there with what I've drawn? I want you to sketch, do this for me, I want you to sketch the friction on here. you got to come back and tell me what's wrong with this. I will. Unless you get it first, I'm thinking about it. You saw my dotted line and you thought it was a graph line. <laughs> I can't wait to face you in court over something, Alan. <laughs> There's nothing that happens. It just cancels all of, all of it out. I draw no. it. I overlaid it to cancel it out. So yeah. It starts happening. What dotted line did you think I was looking at? Oh no no. I wasn't looking at that. I was looking at just what you have there. Come on, Tom. Draw something. Come on, Phil. Speed it up a little bit. Joey, come on, draw that graph for me. We only got a couple minutes left. It's my last chance to drag something out of you. Yeah, John's got the same thing you do, Alan. That's just an integration detail, so do that. Um, oh, I see what you're talking about. I don't have room on my paper for that. <laughs> you do. There you go. There you go. That's supposed to be right down the middle. There's your friction. Okay, yeah, you see you had a net positive, a net negative force, which is actually going to go backwards. You turn on the motor and the thing would take off backwards. You're doing that too. It has zero force in here, very low force, but a huge negative friction force, so it's going to actually take off backwards when you turn the motor on, according to John World. You can't push with a rope, though. All right, now, yeah, I'll good. Phil, what do you got? All right. Remember, how big is the static friction in response to an applied force before it gets moving? Exactly the same. Exactly the same, which means if the 
applied force is a curve like that, then the friction force is going to mimic that. It'll be like that. It won't be a straight line like we had on the other problem. The friction was a straight line on that problem because the applied force was a straight line. Then once it gets moving, drops down, and then we get the constant static uh, kinetic friction from then on. We have the maximum static friction there. So that's what the curve up until then, those two areas are the same. Since the net area is zero, then the net change in velocity is zero.